have um, been talking about pointed prayer. And we begin by emphasizing the outward aspect of that when the church p prayed for Peter. Peter had been arrested, scheduled for execution, and they prayed and God brought freedom, released them. What a, what a wonderful story. And I call that outward, we, the, the pointed prayer that was outward. And then we prayed, uh, then we talked about why we pray. And that was upward because everything that we do, we do for the glory of God. You just look as you read the scripture and even the songs that we sung this morning. We, we want to give glory to God in all that we do because that's why we were created. We were created to give praise. You're going to worship someone, all right? You're going to praise someone. You were created to praise and ultimately we were created to praise God. And I want you to know my prayer has changed. My personal prayer has changed when I'm praying for family, extended family, for friends. I pray now that they would give glory to God now in their lives. Everyone will ultimately give glory, but I pray that we would give glory to God now. Now, on this side, bend the knee, bend our heart, now to the Lord. And I call that upward. But today I want to talk about inward. Pointed prayer inward. Paul prayed some 43 different prayers to the churches that he wrote to. And I went through and listened to all of those prayers that Paul prayed. And it's interesting that, the, that most of the, the, the emphasis that Paul had in those prayers for those churches was that, was that God would do something on the inside. That he would work on the inside of, of, his, of, his, of his followers and that there would be a change that would take place and a growth that would take place on the inside. And let me give you let me give you just a few for instances. He prayed in, in Ephesians that, that that they would have wisdom and knowledge. He, he prayed also in Ephesians that they would have hope. They would understand the hope that God's placed in their hearts. He prayed in Romans that they would have unity. That he says that we might be of one mind, one mouth, glorifying the Lord. And then he prayed that they may have peace. I have to, if you don't know this verse, this is a verse you need to tuck in somewhere. You need to write down somewhere. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 is a very important verse when it comes to peace. Let me just read it to you. You've heard it, but I want to say this. This is what Paul writes. May, now, now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. Give you peace in every situation and in every way always. That's what Paul prayed for. More on that in a moment. Then he prayed for strength. That, and listen to this verse in Colossians 1.11. That we would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Now watch these words here. That we get strength for what reason? What do we need to be strong for? We need, we need to be strong for all patience and long suffering. We need strength not for part patience but for all patience that we would have strength and that we would have strength for long suffering. Some of us will suffer short but long suffering that God would give us strength for long suffering and then Paul prayed for love and we'll look at that in just a moment in Philippians the prayer that we want to examine there and then he prayed that they would have grateful hearts and I suppose that that's almost a checklist that we should have uh, when our day is done have I been grateful today 
if I expressed gratefulness today? And see, so when, when, when we examine the prayers that Paul prayed, he really wants stuff to happen on the inside. So often, I'm, I'm focusing on the outside. God, do this, do this, do this. And not saying, God, do this, do this, do this. Working on me. Working that I would have these things in my life that God wants to, for me to have so that I can be the person that he desires and destined for me to be. And so Paul prayed that for the church. He wanted that to, uh, for the church, that, that they would indeed grow. Now, let me give you a word that you've heard and that you know, but it's a word that we want. I suppose if there's anything that could be said about you and me, it would be this. We are graced people that your testimony would show how God has worked in your life graced if that was on your tombstone that would be a wonderful thing to to have been said about you that you you got it they, they were graced see that doesn't mean you just that doesn't mean you just understood grace what it means is that you got it. It happened to you. I got graced by God. That means the things that God wanted to do in my life, he did. And it showed. It showed. It showed. M more on that. But I mean, let, let me say it like this. Paul, Paul makes this statement in uh, Corinthians 15.10. I think we have, yeah. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than all. Yet not I. But the grace of God which was in me or with me. Paul was graced to do all he did. To show all he did. To share all he did. To live the way that God had chosen for him to have lived. Now, um, sometimes we'll hear this statement. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And that's an interesting statement. But I want you to know something this morning. That nowhere in the New Testament... Are believers called sinners? Do you know that? You know what believers are called in the New Testament? Anybody? Oh, starts with an S. Saints. You're called saints. Now, it's true that we have been saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace. But we are not described as sinners in the New Testament. We are described as saints. Something has happened to us. Paul says, I am a new, what? Creation. We have been changed. That doesn't mean that we're perfect, all right? That's obvious. Just look around. Okay? But the, the testimony that Paul gives, the scripture gives, is that we are his people called by his name. And he does not describe us as sinners. Now, we know. We know what goes on. Oftentimes you'll hear this statement, God, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. That's one of the scariest statements to ever say. God knows my heart. Oh man. Yeah, if God knows our heart and our hearts are sometimes, the, the kind word would be fickled. Okay? But that would be a kind word. But we want to say God 
change those hearts of ours. See, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Greater is he what? Than he? Where is he? Oh, you're not helping me very much. Yeah, come on, that's it, Rick. You got to help me, all right? Greater is he that is? In me. Okay, thank you very much. Than he that is in the world. Paul says, the life I live now, I live by the power of Christ that is in me. He is in us. That's being graced because we recognize. And so, when we're looking at this, these verses of scripture this morning from, from Philippians, there's four things that I've seen and, and, and I've alluded to at different times, but I just call it a life prayer. Because if you, if you look at these, these four verses, or these four parts of it, it's all one verse. If you see even, even in the English, it's just comma after comma after comma. But Paul is praying this, and this I pray. This I pray that your love would abound more and more. This I pray. But he prays for love. He prays for integrity. He prays for fruit. And he prays for excellence. Those are the things... And, and more, of course. But those are, those are the aspects that really show that a, that a, life under, a, a life that has been affected by Christ, and it shows a graced life, a, a life that has these things that, that uh, reflect the Lord. And that's what we are wanting to do. And so he begins like this. One, he, Paul prays that they would have a deep, Discerning love. But let me, let's back up for a moment and, and let's actually read the, the verses. So we will, I want you to have those um, and as I re refer back. Yes. And this I pray. He's praying this. This is Paul's prayer for the church of Philippi and it's a prayer for us today. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge in all discernment. Do you ever think about that? Do I ever think about that? Oh God, let my love abound more, more in knowledge and discernment. Let it abound. That you may approve things that are excellent and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. What a wonderful prayer. I pray that. We prayed that on Wednesday night here. We pray that. I pray that for you. I ask that, God, this would be part of what we would experience as his people. First of all, though, the first thing that he prays for is a, a deep, discerning love. And that the love would grow exponentially. It wouldn't, it wouldn't just be there in a, in a small amount, but it would continue to grow. I'm, one of the concerns I have in the body of Christ is that oftentimes, you know, we say we love, but man, sometimes we just tolerate one another. And... We've got to ratchet this up in our own spirit that there's a genuine concern. Paul says that we would, we would love genuine love. It's the agape type of love that, uh, that is spoken up here. You're aware of this, but we need to be reminded. Jesus says this. He says, they're going to know that they are my disciples because they speak in tongues. No? No. They're going to know that they are my disciples because they love one another. Amen. The emphasis in this text is, is though it's a love toward God, but the emphasis in this text is love for one another. I don't even know if we pray. I, we probably do when somebody's getting on our nerves that we would pray that uh, we would love them 
more. And, uh, and I would have to say that I don't, you know, there's been such times and situations I would pray that, that maybe not so much that people would love, but they'd at least get along. You know, I'm, I have in my file a letter signed by two people who were p- part of Bethel that were conflicting e- each other, and I had to sit them down and have them sign a document that they'll behave with one another. And I have that document that if they ever were to mess up, you know, I'd bring it out and say, look, you signed this between, before me and God that you were going to love one another. Um, it shouldn't have to go that far, okay? But it should be in our hearts that we would. We would love one another. And that, that, it, would, that it would show. It would show. Um, he prays in, to, for the Thessalonians. A little, and when he's writing to them in, in Thessalonians 4.19 uh, he says but concerning brotherly love I have no need that I should write to you for ye yourselves for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another and indeed you do now watch this you do have love but I urge you that you would increase more and more You've love, but would you let it increase? And then he writes to them again later in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 3. He says, you know, I'm just bound to thank God for you because your faith is growing exceedingly. And listen to this. This is, he prayed in 1 Thessalonians that their love would, would grow. This is what he says in 2 Thessalonians. And the love, watch this, of every one of you abounds toward each other. He prayed that they would grow in their love and he testifies that they did grow in their love for one another. God, may we grow in our love for one another. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a love that's intentional. It's, it's a love that's driven by truth. It's not just sent a, a sentimental feeling, you know, that, that we would have. I mean, it's, there's a seriousness to it. We, we want to encourage people to, to move forward in God. I want you to consider a verse with me that kind of opens this up. And it's later in the book of Philippians. And it's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 5. And it, it's really a, 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 an evidence of it. And, and I want you to see this. Now, um, this is the amplified version. And the word here, it, it says, probably and maybe in your translation, it says, let your gentleness, and then it says, be known to all people, the Lord is at hand. That's the verse. Let your gentleness be known unto all people, the Lord is at hand. And I've often paused and said, of all the things that Paul said that should be known to all, he emphasizes this. Whatever it is you've got in your life as a believer, may this be one of these things that is known to everybody. We want to be known by this characteristic. We want to be known by it. So I ask myself the question, am I known by that characteristic? Because Paul says, be known. Let everybody be known. Every believer be known by this characteristic. The word in the language, this gentleness word or, or, or sweet reasonable, there's no English word that can really translate that by itself. It's just, it's too much. It's, the, the word is just loaded in Greek. And we just don't have one English word to kind of express what this is, this gentleness or this kindness that is being spoken. But I think the Amplified picked it up. Because you see it there in brackets. Let your gentle spirit and your graciousness, unselfishness, mercy, tolerance, and patience be known unto all. Boy, are we known by those things? Because the Lord's near. His coming is near. His presence is near. However you want to translate that. That is a wonderful, 
wonderful characteristic. So Paul prays, and I pray, God let Bethel Christians love abound more and more in wisdom and in knowledge and in discernment for your glory. That's what I pray. I've used the phrase loving someone for their highest good. Loving somebody for their highest good. And that's not always easy to do. But that's what we want to do is love for their highest good. Secondly, Paul prays, he prays for their integrity to be solid. That what this means is that their walk would match their words, or their words would match their walk. He writes in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8, he says, You were once in darkness, but now in light. Walk as children of light. And listen to what he says in verse number 10. This is another one of these. Oh, this is good. Verse number 10 says this, of Ephesians 5.10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That's fine. What, what is acceptable to you? We want to walk in a way. We want to find out what's acceptable to you. What pleases you? What is it that you like for us to do? See, it's um, taking responsibility for our lives. Taking responsibility. To say, I am responsible. I am responsible for my attitude. And I am responsible for my actions. That's this idea of integrity. See, it, it comes from the word wholeness. Wholeness. A person who has integrity is whole. You, no doubt, have sat and talked with people. And in, in the conversation, you would say, hmm, something's missing. Something's wrong. Something's not quite right. Something happened to that person. Or something took place. And there is a, you, you see that they're, they're, they're not a whole person. And, and God wants us to be whole. God is the only one that can make us whole. Because in life, the world, situations, try to reach in and pull a piece of us out. And say to us, you will never be whole. And you are broken. And there's things missing. And God wants us to know that he can come in. And he can make up the difference. He makes us whole. Even in the situations where, where, where there's no other way. There's no other way. Something happened to us that should have never happened to us. Somebody took things from us that they should have never taken. It will never be right. But God says differently. See, he prays that, and, and Paul prays that we would, have, we would have that wholeness. Because see, that shows that we have been graced. We have been graced. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. You sit with people whose, whose lives have been shattered. Shattered. You're aware, and, and, and you probably heard me tell this story, but, but you know, one morning years ago, I had a pounding on my door in my office, and a young man brought in a lady that had just been horribly violated. And, and, uh, and, and I'm saying, oh, God, what do I say? What do I say? And, and, I, and, I, and I just, you know, at that moment, I just was, you know, w w lifting a prayer to the Lord because the, it was just such a devastating thing that took place. And I said to her, 
I said, he may have controlled you for a moment or moments, but don't let him control you for a lifetime. And the only way that is possible is with God's help. Don't let it be for a lifetime because that's exactly what the enemy would want to do. To take some event or events and just freeze you there forever. And we say, by God's grace, I'm not staying there. My car will not be parked there. I'm going to put it in gear and by the grace of God, move forward. You, look, you can't do that by yourself. You can't do that by yourself. Another lady calls me on the phone and she's, she's telling me all these things that her husband did. And I'm saying, I am so sorry. You know, God help you. And she says, I'm okay. And I said, ma'am, you're not okay. You can't go through those things without God intervening. You can't. You've got to call upon God. She, act, she was trying to say to herself, it's no big deal. No big deal what her husband has been doing. Of course it was a big deal. And I, I, she was going to crash. And I wanted her to know that only God is going to be able to put you back together. Only God's going to be able to heal the rejection that you've gone through. This is not a small thing. This is not a, a stub your toe or hit your thumb with a hammer. This, this is core pain. And we cannot ignore core pain. Only God can step in and deal with that. So much. So much. See... Responsible people, the whole people, they, they don't put a stumbling block. They become a stepping stone. And, and, and I think I've mentioned this before. A stumbling block is really a stepping stone out of place. You should have put something that could help somebody get up. Instead, you put something that knocks somebody down. We want to be stepping stones so that people can be lifted up lifted up we want to fight the good fight I've met people and you have that they're not fighting the good fight they're fighting the fight but it's not a good fight third character reflecting fruit and, and this is all encompassing this is all tied together that a person's life would show the grace it, it would show as Galatians talked about in Galatians 5 the fruit of the spirit, the love, joy, peace patience and all those things that are listed those nine things that are listed there but what this, what this says is it says this is what right living looks like this is what a graced person looks like and this is what he wants this is what God wants for us you talk about a pointed prayer you talk about being able to face anything that you gotta face if we're whole graced on the inside come hell or high water we can keep moving forward because something on the inside is settled. And when it's on the inside settled, you can take the, the, the pain, you can take the, the onslaught from the outside because you're anchored on the inside. Come on, no more than that. No, we're not talking perfection. Of course not. But we are talking direction. Paul says this in the next chapter in Philippians. Do all things. 
How many things? things. Without complaining and disputing. Isn't it easy to complain? Oh my, I mean, it is just, it just, I don't even have to work at it. It just comes natural. Come natural. Now, I had the craziest dream this morning. It's just funny. Let me just tell you because uh, I dream about all kinds of stuff. But this, this morning, I get up used to about 6 o'clock. And, and so uh, I dreamed, I got up, and I was up. That's dangerous because you're not up and you're dreaming. I dreamed I was up at 6 and I was already moving around. And then all of a sudden, I wake up and I'm not up. All right? And it's a little past 6. That's that's crazy dreaming, all right? <laughs> what does that mean? It just, it's just, I just wanted to tell you, that's all. Um, as I mentioned, at the end of the day, you want to ask yourself if you're grateful. Do all things. I don't know, that may be one of the toughest, toughest challenges that I have. To do all things without complaining and disputing. You gotta have some things you can complain about. There's just gotta be some things that's okay to complain about. Surely, surely there's some things. But you gotta do all things without complaining. Now you may not like it, but the attitude is gonna be different. Yep. And then he goes on to say this in the same section in Philippians. Do all things without complaining or disputing that you may become blameless, harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you, watch this, shine as lights in the world. Grateful people shine. Lastly, um, in number four, a proven excellence. Not just to get by. Not just to get by. But the word approve. Approve. It it carries the idea of metal being uh, purified by fire. We, We need to stop. We need to listen. We need to learn. Now, we may do a lot of listening. I don't know how much learning. We've heard this, we've heard this. Uh, uh, because Paul would say in just a moment, I'll read it in a moment, that, that, that we learn, that, 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 that he, he, he tells them to, to uh, uh, the things which you have learned, he says in a moment, I'll read that. But we want a heart and a mind that's governed by truth, God's word. What, what does God say? What does God say? And, and I think about the, the armor, and one of the elements of the armor is the, the belt of truth. And, and you, you've studied and read and all of those uh, aspects about the, the armor, and you know, the, the, the soldier, soldier's uniform. I mean, if he's going to run, he's got to kind of gird himself up, and he, and he kind of you know, pulls up his 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 uh, his dress, you know, in, in his in his uh, in his uh, uh, wear, and and he ties, he ties that so that uh, uh, he's not going to get caught. And th- this belt of truth, we wrap it around us and we tie it because we know that's what's going to hold us together. Because it's this is not Phi Beta Kappa, okay? This. In the garden, what did Satan say to Eve? Hath hath God said? Hath God said? I mean, this is as old as it can be to question the truth of God so that we would miss what he has said. For us. Paul would say later in the book, things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, 
Think on those things. Think on those things. And then he says, the things which you've learned, received, heard, saw in me, do. And if you do these things, he says, the peace of God will be with you. <laughs> this, is, this is so tied together and it's so wonderful. The peace that keeps us together as a person. See, God's peace keeps you together. Keeps you together. And that's, that's what he wants for us. Graced people have captured these things, have captured these things, and as a result of it, they are together. So my prayer, Lord, I pray that you would give us a love that is deep and discerning. That you would give us a solid integrity that we would be whole.